Well, hello again. Um, so I'm Leslie Mitchell. Uh, also, I am still in the Buka lab as a postdoc. Um, and so <laughs> it's been a couple hours. There's a lot of rapid change in, in this field, uh, moment to moment, but that my employment status has not changed. Uh, um, so again, oh, here are the slides are. So um, I will uh, give you a brief overview of um, the genome foundry at ISG, which we have developed um, to support our interest in designing and building synthetic eukaryotic chromosomes, um, although we're not totally married to eukaryotic chromosomes, to be clear. So just to give you an idea of some of the activities um, in the Buka lab that require what I will talk about for, with respect to the genome foundry. Um, oops. Um, we have gotten, gone sort of whole hog into building um, de novo designed chromosomes. And of course, this all has um, borne out from the SC2 project um, where chromosomes are designed and range in length from hundreds of KB up to megabases of DNA and require extensive um, analysis of yeast colonies to identify those that contain exclusively segments of synthetic DNA and lack um, the replaced sequences of wild-type DNA. Um, so we started thinking about this idea of using um, genotyping assays to identify yeast colonies carrying the DNA of interest really, really early on. Since then, we've started thinking about, on the right side, building uh, de novo design pathways for expression in yeast and beyond. Um, where typically these sequences don't exist in nature and require a total design from scratch and then ordering DNA. Um, and as we all know, DNA fragments come typically in two to five KB pieces, um, such that um, the requirement is an assembly step to achieve full-length pathway assembly, which in this case is on the order of 15 or 20 KB. Um, we've also gotten interested, um, as Matt alluded to yesterday and I spoke about briefly this Oh, I guess this idea of building big DNA, um, in particular for mammalian gene loci, um, where we source our material either from genomes um, of existing cells, BACs or YACs, um, and then want to build from scratch in order to introduce a lot of designer mutations or variants, um, and also pathways for expression in mammalian systems. Um, so these are some of the activities that are ongoing in the Buka lab, all of which we have sort of coalesced on this idea of identifying fragments of DNA that we need to assemble, and we're going to use yeast for that assembly because that we've learned a lot about um, using yeast for assembly through the SC2 project. So I'll introduce you to the, the team working at the Genome Foundry at ISG, um, where we're working to develop a cradle-to-grave workflow for the design, assembly, and verification of big DNA assembled in yeast that's supported by a custom laboratory information management system. Um, Andrew Martin. Um, is the um, automation and robotics expert. Uh, Vinny, Vincent Major is a former rotation student who wrote a lot of the software for an analysis of data coming off the work cell um, that I'll talk about. Henry Berger is a current technician in the lab who is a whiz on the robots and in the lab. Uh, Sergey German is um, the automation engineer who's writing the limbs. And Laura McCullough is a new graduate student who's here today, as well as Henry. Um, and she's working on um, building the big DNA. So the general workflow that uh, we're undertaking is as follows. Um, it starts with DNA design, um, and that captures our intended function of whatever we're trying to build um, or designer elements that we want to introduce into the sequence. Um, that design will enable the delivery, the downstream delivery to the destination organism, um, and also enable the assembly and yeast, which is really a function of segmentation, taking the design sequence and breaking it into small pieces in a way that we can either order them from synthesis companies or um, derive them from PCR products or otherwise. Um, so we source the DNA, um, as I kind of just alluded to, um, via commercial synthesis, PCR amplification, and we use template of BACs, YACs, or genomes um, for that. Uh, we then assemble the DNA um, using custom vectors that are designed um, to shuttle between typically yeast and E. coli, although we've also built vectors for shuttling into mammalian systems um, in yeast. Um, and then we get into the heart of what the ISG Foundry is really about, uh, which is junction analysis. So as I mentioned, all of these fragments are assembled in yeast based on terminal overlaps between neighboring or adjacent pieces of DNA. Um, and so I'll talk about this in depth, but the idea is to evaluate 
many, many yeast colonies to identify those clones that carry all of the junctions that should have assembled. Um, and we do that in a high throughput manner. Uh, the data coming out of that junction analysis is analyzed in an um, automated uh, system. Uh, the data is actually real-time PCR data. Um, and so we use a, a process uh, or a technology, I guess a algorithm called max ratio quantification that I can talk about later if you want. Um, and we ID the colonies that carry all the junctions, um, which then uh, those colonies are processed for further verification um, and downstream work. And uh, importantly, all of, this, um, all of these activities are supported by this LIMS that Sergey is writing, which tracks all the way from DNA design um, and then supports the activities that happen during junction analysis and then tracks all of the information um, uh, along the entire process. So this is just a, a picture of the robots that are housed in the genome foundry. The system starts with colony picking. This is a Cupix for molecular devices. Just behind here, you can't see it, is a Felix, which is a relatively large volume uh, liquid handler. Um, and in these two robots, we prepare uh, genomic DNA from yeast from many colonies. Um, uh, in over after growth, we prepare the genomic DNA, and then we really get into the heart of what we call the work cell, which is an integrated robotic work cell for the evaluation of junctions um, at a throughput of 1536. So we have a number of robots that are involved in the automated work cell, uh, an echo for nanoscale liquid dispensing, a microscale robot um, for dispensing into the qPCR plate, and that's from Art Robbins. Robotic arms, plate stacks, an automated centrifuge, a peeler, and a sealer, and then the Roche 1536 light cycler. So with these intact, and it's been integrated in partnership with Hudson Robotics, um, we can do high throughput gene expression analysis, but really the bulk of our workflow is, is housed in this genotyping, where we can do qPCR tag analysis for SC2, junction PCR um, analysis, um, and of course we can do other, other activities like assessing multiple edits that are made in a single cell across many loci. Um, but the junction PCR assay, it looks a little bit like this, where in this case there's four junctions, sorry, three junctions across four fragments, and we just design primers that span those junctions. And then in the qPCR assay, ask whether those junctions are present or, ab present or absent. So it's a simple genotyping assay. Um, and then we evaluate um, which colonies carry all of the junctions, and then move to downstream analysis. So a major activity here is we want to build bigger and faster. And so how many junctions can we put together? And so we've spent some time um, evaluating and trying to answer that question. Um, the more you can put together at one time, the bigger your construct will ultimately be. And so um, in 13-piece assemblies, using the work cell to evaluate presence or absence of the junctions, we know that we can assemble 13 fragments about 50% of the time to put together a 50 kb construct. Um, with 20 pieces to assemble a 63 kb construct, we're down in the 15% region, um, and then that progressively drops off. Um, but what this really tells us is that with this high throughput genotyping assay, even when we're putting together nearly 100 kb of DNA, we're still finding, we have the capacity to screen the colonies to find winners, um, even though it's down in the 3% range. Um, we can find those winners and put together really big pieces of DNA really quickly. Um, and this was all done on independent colonies from independent assembly experiments. Um, this is an, exper an example of a locus we put together in the foundry, which uh, it's actually two variants of a locus. It's the mouse alpha globin locus that I talked about earlier. So this is in collaboration with Doug Higgs. And we've built out, this is what the locus looks like. And the goal here was to build a wild type sequence and um, also build a synthetic sequence lacking four enhancer elements. And so then these molecules can be put into a mouse ES cell um, and a mouse grown and ask what are the effects phenotypically on um, the absence of those um, four enhancer elements. Uh, and so this is a, a 100 kb molecule nearly. Um, wild type is 94 and the synthetic is 90 kb. And so in three assembly steps, we put these things together. And this is just showing that we can put them together and they're customized such that they carry the particular regions that are required for integration into the downstream um, mouse ES cell. Uh, so there's the five prime half of the HPRT that I talked about earlier and the other lock site. Um, and this is just showing you that we, we can recover these constructs into E. coli for sequence verification, which is it's done and these things have sequence verified for the most part um, and they can be digested. And this is a pulse field gel just showing the physical DNA intact. Um, and so 
the point of all of this is that um, we've developed this workflow through a need in the lab, um, and that's driven the um, work going on, or what we've, the, the robots we've integrated um, were driven by a need in the lab, and I think that's a nice model for building up um, the use of foundries. Um, so with that, I will, um, oopsie, just say thanks to everybody involved. Uh, it's a lot of the same people from the previous slide, um, but in particular to the, this crew um, in the automation suite um, today today, putting together uh, the use of these robots to enable uh, the entire group and uh, the other members of the NYU community. Um, and we're always interested in talking to partners about building DNA of interest to anybody. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. sequence verification in that pipeline. That, that would seem to be a bottleneck somehow, somewhere. Uh-huh. Uh, so you can either sequence the yeast colony, and coming along for the ride with that would be the molecule you've assembled. Um, or you can recover into E. coli, and we've been packed bio-sequencing these. But yeah, that is a, that's a step that's taking time. Um, I think that can be mitigated by bringing in sequencing technology in-house. I mean, we're using NYU core facilities right now, but that could be sped up dramatically by um, you know, having sequencing directly as part of our pipeline. That's a great question. Um, so I think um, in the alpha globin locus uh, for the synthetic, uh, and we've sequenced now one isolate of the wild type and, and the synthetic, so it's a small number here, but we found, I think, three SNPs um, associated likely with the assembly, although we need to go back and check that. So they likely derive from PCR. So it's a very small number over like almost a little bit more than 90 KB. Um, but you're right, that's a concern. I think there's a, a lot of different ways to go about uh, the process. So it almost just mimics what we really want to do one day, which is um, use this just-in-time delivery system. I failed to mention that we're not stocking parts typically in the freezer. So we design and order in DNA on command when we're ready to use it. So we're not keeping you know, libraries for different standardized assembly approaches. Um, and so in the hopefully near future, we wouldn't be doing PCR. We would just be ordering all these fragments in from a synthetic DNA company, um, which would be coming sequenced, cloned, and verified. Um, but right now, this is sort of developing that workflow via hacking it by using PCR. So Leslie, yeah. how much room is there for uh, molecular engineering of your strains to enhance the uh, assembly process? Oh, that's a great question, yeah. So like the yeast strain we're using for assembly. Exactly. So. Ah, that's a great question. Um, I think the answer is um, you could find a strain that's particularly um, transformable and, and good at taking up DNA. And I think um, I was thinking about talking to Farron about this, that. He's also interested in that activity of having highly um, competent yeast cells. You can also have cells that, um, I'm going give, to give away some secrets here, but um, inducibly shut down homologous recombination to minimize the effects of repeats within your sequence. So once it's assembled, if you want to propagate it in yeast, um, if there are internal repeats, they may sort of loop out. So if you have homologous recombination for assembly and then shut it off, Afterwards, you may maintain the full length sequence with a higher degree of accuracy. Um, and other sort of ideas around that to, to improve yeast assembly. I think there's a lot of ideas. Yeah. 